Chapter 13 At the commando camp, the mountain mist had thickened, and the canyon night was alive with the crackle and hoot and screech of the prowler beasts. A few of the team managed to nod off for a few restless moments at a time, but the men were so wired and on edge that true rest was mostly impossible. The spent commandos were operating on sheer raw nerve, headachy, cranky and exhausted, yet forced to a state of alertness by the consuming fear of an enemy they still couldn't name. Ramirez squatted a few feet from Mac and turned to the brawny vet. You got any more smoke, buddy? Shit, no. Toked the last one while the boss was giving that spick whore the third degree. No offence, you lousy wetback. Mac coughed and chuckled comfortably at his own good-natured racial slurs. Eat shit and die, asshole, Ramirez shot back. Then he laughed heartily too, and they winked at each other. Yet even as they played this game, Mac noticed a sudden change in the background noise. He crossed his lips with a forefinger to silence Ramirez because he'd noticed an odd lull in one quadrant of the jungle darkness. The normal scurrying rodents, frantic for a safe harbour from hungry predators, the calls of baboons teasing and warning each other of a stalking cheetah, all had turned dead quiet in the north-northeast. Mac instantly gripped the trigger of his gun barrel, his jaw clenched. Then somewhere, off in the trees, a barely negligible metallic click signalled the sound of a warning flare rocketing over the area. A moment later, a brilliant flash exploded as the flare burst into flame, momentarily illuminating the camp as if a shooting star had hurtled by. Then an echoing scream filled the night as a startled intruder ran roughshod through the undergrowth towards the men, branches cracking, the dull thump of heavy feet growing louder. Yet the commotion was so fast, and the misty shadows and canyon night so full of ricocheted sound, no one could tell what was charging into the camp. But the attacking creature was making a beeline straight towards Mac, who stood, aiming his M202 at the unidentified enemy. It broke through a last gnarled bramble and leaped with a roar for the throat of the tough soldier, knocking him into his foxhole. Mac hollered in stunned surprise, and the rest of the men rushed to the side of the darkened pit, where it was impossible to distinguish Mac from the enemy he battled. Grunts and inhuman growling rose from the foxhole as the commandos stood by helplessly, reluctant to fire for fear of injuring Mac. It was as if each man was standing defenceless at his own grave. A few final bursts from the flare briefly illuminated the foxhole, yet still they could not separate the two clenched and thrashing figures. Then for a second, a blinding gleam startled the men in the circle as Max Machete caught the light like an ancient warrior's sword. The sky faded to dark again as the flare burned itself out. Just then, a geyser of blood shot up from the hole, splattering on Schaefer's boot. Following that, a high-pitched scream, unmistakably a death cry, reverberated off the canyon walls. But whose? Tortured seconds passed, as the men waited anxiously for the dust to settle, for the victor, if there was one, to stand. All guns were aimed at the pit in case Mac had been the loser. Silence had replaced the sounds of struggle. Then a figure slowly pulled himself up, grunting a sigh and propping himself against the crumbling wall of the foxhole. It was Mac, covered in sweat and dirt, gasping for breath, clothes shredded and bloodied, his knife dangling limply at his side. He looked up directly at Schaefer, his chest heaving as he gulped in the humid night air and whispered hoarsely, Got the motherfucker! He grinned between gasps. The Major snapped on a flashlight and raked the foxhole. Lying in a pool of blood, Max and its own, stretched a massive wild boar, still quivering in the final throes of death. For the first time, Mac had a clear look at his opponent and stared in disbelief at the creature that almost killed him. A pig, he muttered with an edge of disappointment, shame almost. Just a fucking pig. Schaefer slowly shined his light the full length of the animal. Its deadly sharp tusks gleamed like a weird trophy in the light. Ramirez peered over the edge and looked down in awe. Holy shit, Mac. The Chicano exclaimed, Shove an apple in that motherfucker's mouth and that ought to feed us for a month. 
Max snarled up at the Mexican in mock anger. I ain't planning on staying around here long enough for dinner. She's all yours, buddy. With the men's attention focused on the dead animal, Anna took advantage of the moment's distraction. A confused recollection of her cause returned to mind, and she hustled to make a quick escape. She stooped and picked up the MP5 from the ground with her bound hands. Then she turned, staring into the mist-enshrouded night for a way out. But even as she moved forwards a few yards, her fears of what might be waiting in the dark came rushing back, clouding her sense of resolution again. She stopped and looked up at the opaque sky, and the dim round of the moon played above the trees like a magic eye. For a second, she imagined she could feel the gaze of the alien's golden honeycomb eyes piercing the mist. She remembered the spearing of Hawkins with a moan of horror. She abandoned the idea of running and dropped the gun back to the ground. By now, the Major and Ramirez had dragged the still-shaking Mac from the foxhole. A huge gash ripped across the thatch of hair on the victor's chest, one of the boar's brute attempts to skewer him on its deadly tusks. Get a field dressing on him right away, Schaefer instructed harshly. This whole scene seemed all wrong. The violence was crude and stupid and the enemy was dumb. It was almost like a mockery of the real horror that lay in wait in the jungle fog. Ramirez ran to grab the medic's bag as Billy, who'd been scouting the perimeter beyond the foxholes, called out. Major, over here! He shouted urgently. Schaefer turned apprehensively something dire in Billy's tone warning him that the Indian had discovered something bad and irreversible. Dutch walked with bitter resignation towards the scout, whom he found standing with a flashlight pointed at the canvas bag that had cradled Blaine's body. It was violently slashed open, covered in blood, empty. The Sioux looked up at the Major and spoke the obvious, as if he found some weird comfort in sticking strictly to the facts. The body's gone he said flatly. Ramirez came running up. He had patched Mac up, then made a quick tour and checked out the tripwires surrounding the camp. Came in through the wires, he reported. Took him right out from under our noses. Anna, once more seeking the security of the men, appeared at their side and stared down into the empty blood-soaked bag. Then she glanced anxiously into Schaefer's eyes. The Major knew from her stricken look that she sensed, that she knew that the horror that had driven her mind astray was not just a nightmare. The body bag woke her up for good. She looked as if she would never sleep again. Hours passed in a grim silence. Each of the men turned in on himself and hunkered above his weapon. Slowly, the blue-black pre-dawn sky offered a hushed clarity, and the men's imaginations were calmed by the gathering light. A patchy ground fog still covered the area. Anna, who'd finally been overtaken by sleep, awoke with a start in her foxhole, the rising cacophony of early morning jungle music reaching its high-pitched tempo. A blue-tailed monkey screamed at a cropping mountain goat. A cheetah yawned and turned belly up, fat and sleepy from a night of eating a side of deer. Directly above Anna's head, a chameleon emerged on a leaf. Carefully, the rebel woman extended her arm, allowing the lizard to crawl onto her, watching fascinated as it changed colour to match her tawny skin tone. Then she gently placed the creature back on the leaf and watched with a half smile as it changed once more to a cool green and glided into the jungle. Schaefer, Billy and Ramirez were busy examining the area near the empty bag, poring over every inch of tripwire, worrying the ground for signs and hints of what had happened. Boar set off the trap, Billy reported to Schaefer finally. No other tracks. Schaefer knelt and examined the thin, well-hidden stretch of wire, with the ash grey short in the copper where the boar's hoof had connected. Then the Major stood, looking around the makeshift camp. The canyon below was slowly steaming clear of mist. How the hell could anything get through this setup and carry Blaine out? Observed Ramirez, with brooding frustration. And they did it right under the light of a flare without leaving a fucking trace. The Chicano kicked a rock in frustration, exploding a nest of centipedes that scurried away in panic. Schaefer considered the possibilities, 
his eyes drawing a bead on the tree line as if it were a graph. He's using the trees, he said at last, pointing to the thick crowned cottonwoods. The bastard knows our defences, he went on bitterly. Then he caught his own use of the singular noun. Instinctively, he'd concluded that this was not the work of a team. There was nothing gorilla-like about it. It was the macabre work of a singular enemy, and thus the logic sided more and more with Billy's story. In his mind, Schaefer traced the path the intruder might have travelled through the trees, then down to the ground where it could have hopped the tripwire. But what sort of creature could move like that, he didn't have a clue. What he did know was that they were dealing with a remarkable villain, cunning beyond anything Schaefer had witnessed in Thailand, Beirut or any other blood hole of the world. Somehow, it seemed, this enemy flew through the trees with the dexterity of a monkey and across open turf with the speed and agility of a jaguar. On top of that, it possessed the strength of ten gorillas and the subtle stealth of all the wildcats of the jungle combined. God knew what else it could do. And so far there'd been no sign of even a knife or a pistol, let alone the kind of high-tech combat gear the commandos carried. So far, Schaefer thought grimly, there wasn't a sign of anything human. As the Major squinted along the Dawn Street tree line, Billy and Ramirez stood rigid and motionless, glaring blankly in among the branches, seeming to share a dread as acute as their mutual feel for the flow of the trail. It was becoming clear to each of the remaining commandos that they were up against terrible odds. Ramirez, normally the tough, abrasive street kid, blunt and not given to asking questions, suddenly revealed a rare twinge of anxiety. Why didn't he try to kill one of us last night? He asked in the meek tones of a child afraid to sleep without a nightlight. Schaefer turned abruptly to him. He came back for the body, he replied coldly. He's killing us one at a time, like a... Predator, Billy stated flatly, his face showing no emotion. Schaefer was sick and tired of vague explanations. He turned to Anna, their only concrete witness. He reached down, his eyes blazing and his jaw tensed, and yanked her firmly to her feet. Yesterday, what did you see? She stared back at the Major vacantly, but Schaefer's insisting expression seemed to shake her out of trance. She struggled to keep reality clear. The Major was determined to drag the information out of her if he had to cut out her tongue, but he saw at least that she was struggling to respond. She began to speak slowly. I... I don't know what it was. She started, then balked as a rush of tears filled her eyes. She had a terrible longing to confess to the old drunken priest at the convent school. Go on, Schaefer persisted, more gently now. It changes colour, she continued, haltingly. Just like the chameleon, it uses the jungle and hides. Dylan cut her off, his ear for the truth limited to what he could see, feel and measure. Shit, lady, you trying to tell me those guys were killed by a fucking lizard? Don't listen to her, man. He raged at Schaefer. It's just a gorilla con job, as sure as shit a con job. She's trying to get our defenses down. Schaefer ignored the black man's ranting and cut the hardline approach to the frightened girl. He reached out and took her hands and looked directly at her star-shot eyes. What's your name? He asked quietly. She gazed back into his own calm, unblinking eyes, momentarily cautious as to this sudden new tactic. She hesitated a second, then gave in. So needful was she for a little tenderness. Anna, she whispered. Anna Gonsalves. She sounded as modest as if she was talking to the Mother Superior. Listen to me, Anna Gonsalves, Schaefer replied in a parental tone, stern but reassuring. You know we have the same enemy now, don't you? She nodded in grave agreement. Still looking her squarely in the eyes, the Major drew out his commando knife and carefully sliced through her rope bonds with a single sweep of the blade. Dylan was stunned. Fuck, Dutch! What the hell do you think you're doing? He bawled, eyes wide with outrage. Not taking his eyes off the dark-haired girl, the Major acknowledged Dylan wearily, 
with no small hint of condescension. No more prisoners, Dylan. We need everybody now. What are you talking about? We're not going anywhere, Dylan, Schaefer said briskly, his tone more along the lines of an order than a suggestion. You out of your mind? The black leader slapped at an elephant leaf in frustration. He could see that Schaefer was serious, but had no idea what the strategy was. We're only two, maybe three miles from the border. Tops, he went on helplessly. We're almost home, Dutch. That chopper's not going to wait. We've got to go. Schaefer turned away from Anna and faced the black man head on. He spoke with brute authority. Face it, Dylan. You know as well as I do. We're just part of somebody's game. And he don't give a fuck who we are or who she is. This has nothing to do with your shit-ass little war game. You want another stripe on that pretty starched uniform hotshot? Well, we don't take a stand now. You're not even going to make it over the next anthill alive. You can forget Langley and all your ass-kissing cousins, partner. None of it's going to do you a shitload of good lying here with your guts carved out. Dylan blinked back, knowing full well that Schaefer was on target. He didn't want to hear what he already knew to be true, but he couldn't hide from it anymore either. Not all the statistics and paperwork in the world could mask the horror that hovered palpably all around them now. Anna, sensing a lull in the heated exchange between the two soldiers, reached out and touched Schaefer's arm. Somehow, she understood he was to be trusted now, and she was determined to help all the way. She was drawn to Schaefer's strength, startled at the magnitude of his physical power. None of her comrades exuded this kind of command. There's something else she said urgently. When the big man was killed, one of you must have wounded the thing. Its blood rubbed off on the leaves. And she reached down and pointed to the fading amber stain on her pant leg. Schaefer turned to Dylan with a tight grin. If it bleeds, we can kill it, he announced matter-of-factly. All we need's a shot at it, so let's get loaded up, huh? I want to nail me a Martian.'